let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner, and our engineer is Aaron Thomas. Our distinguished guest for the entire two hours of the show tonight is Mark Lowison, the world's most respected historical authority on the Beatles. Mark is joining us to talk about the 900-plus page first volume of his extraordinary biography of this band that changed the world. We quoted from Mark in our book, Inside the Yellow Submarine, and lately we've exchanged quite a few emails in the seemingly fruitless search for a paper trail to document the history of the Beatles' Yellow Submarine film. If anyone can turn up these elusive documents, it's Mark Lewison. And I wait with bated breath to read what he's uncovered when Volume 2 comes out. Tonight, however, we are focusing on the earliest years of the Beatles because this book, Tune In, The Beatles All These Years, Volume 1, ends in 1962. In addition to writing several books about the Beatles, Mark Lewison has also written several books about British comedy, another field that I'm very interested in. The liner notes for several Paul McCartney albums, including one of my favorites, Flaming Pie, the retrospective six-CD box set produced by George Martin, 50 Years in Recording, and the Beatles album One. He also helped to edit the book Hendrix, Setting the Record Straight, written by John McDermott and Eddie Kramer, both of whom we've interviewed on 21st Century Radio. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Mark Lewison. Thank you very much, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. Mark, before we get started, I want to tell you something. You have given us interviewers a real challenge by writing such a good book that's over 800 pages long, especially for interviewers like me who are almost as completist and detailed-oriented as you are. I was so tempted to prepare a page-by-page analysis, which means we probably would have talked for seven hours, and pick apart the hundreds of anecdotes in your book and ask you about each one. I did read almost every page, but unfortunately, unless you have 80 hours, me, we realized we had to take a different approach, and we have followed your lead and organized our interview into six chronological sections in an attempt to cover all the time periods you have written about in this volume one. Now, we'll ask you bullet point questions based on each chapter, and I want to remind our listeners that our conversation tonight will just barely scratch the surface. I mean, not even that. It's not even a scratch. We're just well, we're just talking a little bit about it. And you are strongly urged to read this book, especially if you think you already know everything there is to know about the Beatles. This book proves conclusively that you do not, not by a long shot. First of all, Mark, I would like to know how you went about organizing this material. You have written previous books that are essentially a day-by-day chronological history of the Beatles. So how did your approach to this one differ? Oh, um, yes, you're right. The, the, the Pretty much all the books on the Beatles that I've written before this have been reference books of one kind or another. Um, my very first book on the Beatles was actually published 30 years ago last month, and that was called The Beatles Live. And it was an attempt to catalogue every live engagement the Beatles had performed, every stage performance, if you like, uh, from when they formed as a schoolboy skiffle group in Liverpool in 1957 to their last stage performance in San Francisco in August 1966. So that was, in a sense, a catalogue, but there was quite a lot of text in there as well because what I realised from the start is that whilst you may be researching facts, the facts themselves begin to tell a story. Um, and facts can do two things to a book. If they're misused, they can bog the book down so that the reader just gets stuck inside a mire of of information that uh, might be interesting, but it's not being told well enough to engage their interest. Or the facts can be used to enhance and illuminate the story. And... um, I found right from the beginning that I that I had uh, 
an ability I was unaware of until that point to actually realize the story in the information I was finding. So that was my first book, and quite a few other books followed, the Beatles recording sessions being the one that most people know. Um, but there were others as well. I did a guidebook to the Beatles London. Um, so for any tourists who come to London, it was a book that would actually tell them places they could go and visit that had some his historical connection to the Beatles. Uh, I co-authored that book. This book, however, um, which is a trilogy, The Beatles All These Years, Tune In is the first of a three-volume project, um, is a biography. It's a narrative. It's not an encyclopedia. It's not something that you would just open up and check a fact or a date. It's actually uh, a narrative. So it begins at the beginning and really is best experienced by reading it through to the end in that order. My other books being the kind of books that you would just open anywhere and check something. So it did require a different um, method of organising the material. Um, but I, I decided right from the outset that I was going to make the book strictly sequential. I really wanted to have the story in this book unfold in the same way that it unfolded for its participants. So they don't know on a Tuesday what's going to be happening on the Wednesday. They may have an appointment or an engagement in their diaries, but they don't really know how Wednesday will unfold until Wednesday has been lived. Um, and that's true for all of us in our, all of our lives, and it's, it's, there's no other way around it. And I knew that the book could gain strength from being told in that way, and it, it certainly has, because one of the common responses that I've had from readers is that the book takes them into the moment where the Beatles are. They feel like they're in the cavern with them, or in Hamburg with them, or in the van with them, or in their houses, or wherever, in school, wherever the Beatles are, even before they're the Beatles. It feels, as the reader, that you're there. And that is because the, the information is organised. Um, and that organisation is a major challenge for me, because... This is not a subject of, about which there's only a little knowledge. Um, there is vast amounts of knowledge on the Beatles, and I spend my my every day, my every hour of every day, looking for more and finding it um, still constantly. So uh, one has to keep keep everything marshalled in such a way that it actually does make sense. Um, that was tough for Volume 1. Volume 2 of the trilogy, which I'm working on at the moment, is even tougher in that regard, because um, the events are happening simultaneously all around the world, and for me to actually make strategic chronological sense of that is a great challenge, but um, it's one that, it's one that uh, I feel I can do. So I, as to quote an old quiz TV quiz show over here in England. I've started, so I'll finish. So that's the secret as to why it hangs together so well, and that it's easier to remember what you're saying because you're actually the the reader is is actually learning it at the same time. Of, well, in a certain time sequence, in other words, and I, I, you know that's a hell of a hard thing to do. Yes, the very act of pulling everything together um, is is a hugely refreshing one for the reader because the book is a combination of many, many things, but I'll, I'll focus on two in particular. It's information or material, colour, anecdotes, whatever you want to call it, that has never been revealed before. And the same information, colour, anecdotes and so on that has been revealed before, but not necessarily understood before or put in the right context the combination of weaving the two together and organizing everything so that it actually has the correct flow makes it seem like you've never seen any of it before because it makes much more sense this way so um, even if you've read every other book on the Beatles and memorized it and of course hardly anybody has you would still think this was new because it's being used in a different way uh, there are some areas that uh, are so new to me, uh, especially in regards to how the Beatles got recorded and uh, George Martin, Sir George Martin's part in that. That was an extraordinary. Maybe later on we'll get a chance to do that.
Now, let's start at the beginning with your entire first section devoted to the 100 years before any of the band members in the Beatles were even born. You call it old before our birth, and it starts with Liverpool in 1845. Why yeah. was such a lengthy portrait of the city of Liverpool essential to understanding the Beatles as a phenomenon? Because Liverpool is such a key part of the Beatles' history. Um, it's We all come from somewhere, um, and in some instances, probably in the majority of our instances, the place that we hail from does not necessarily make such a huge impact on our lives. Um, I mean, it, it, it can to a degree always, but um, I think in the case of Liverpool, England... Uh, it, it had a marked effect on the characters and the personalities in this story. It gave them some. Well, it added to what they obviously had in in themselves in their in their own DNA, which was a great sense of humour and it, and great strength of character. Um, it also made it also meant that the Beatles were part of a music scene in their home city, the like of which existed at that time nowhere else in the world. So why is this story set in Liverpool? That's the question. Why is this a Liverpool story? Everybody knows they come from Liverpool. Why? And the answer is that the Beatles have strong, or three of the Beatles have strong Irish roots. Uh, So why are the Irish in Liverpool? Well, the Irish are in Liverpool because of the appalling potato famine in the middle of the 19th century. Um, The blight on the potato that killed the crop that meant mass starvation for almost everyone in Ireland um, and disease and, and just a, just an appalling um, phenomenon to, to occur uh, and it meant that the Irish fled Ireland in, in mass numbers and of course that meant a great influx into the United States and it also meant a great influx into Liverpool because they got on the boats in Dublin and other places, Belfast and so on and they ended up in Liverpool uh, many then sailed on to other places, but many stayed. And the book begins with the Lennons arriving in Liverpool, uh, and the birth very soon after that arrival of John Lennon. Now, this is not our John Lennon, this is his grandfather, the other John Lennon, the original Liverpool John Lennon, who John Lennon's grandfather, who he never met, that he died in 1921. But by all accounts, he was the same kind of character as his grandson would be. Uh, And what you find with the Beatles family backgrounds is that this is not in the least bit tedious, this genealogy. They are interesting families uh, leading interesting lives. And it tells the tale of the city. And I so I use the, the lives of these forefathers of the Beatles to tell the tale of Liverpool and the build up to eventually, quite quickly, the build up to the Second World War when uh, our heroes are born. The Beatles are all war babies uh, and they're born in a city that is being devastated by the Germans uh, on top of its own natural devastations of the Depression and so on. So um, it's a, it's a very compelling story, and that's why it begins so early. Well, I'm so glad you did it that way because I've only been to Liverpool three times, and um, of course I remember some of the things that about the Irish and the potato thing. It was really um, heartbreaking, and more well, it's worse than heartbreaking. Well, we need to take a break right here. When we get back, we're going to pick up with um, guaranteed not to split. That's what we'll talk about. Our music going out is In Spite of All the Danger, a song recorded by the Lennon-McCartney-Harrison band known as the Quarrymen in 1958 that was released as part of the Beatles anthology. We were just talking about Liverpool and how dangerous a place it was, so we thought this was appropriate. Hello there, this is George Martin, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus as we'll hear from our guest, Mark Lewison, joining us to talk about Volume 1 of his incredible Beatles biography called Tune In, The Beatles All These Years by Crown Archetype. Learn more at www.marklewison.net. That's Mark, L-E-W-I-S-O-H-N.net. 
Mark, I love your chapter titles. They, they are so much more intriguing than a boring old timeline. Chapter 5 is called Guaranteed Not to Split and covers the first half of 1957. What was Guaranteed Not to Split? Guaranteed Not to Split was a sticker that was on the inside in the sound hole of John Lennon's first own guitar. Uh, bought for him by his mother from a mail order company, actually a South African guitar, um, imported to the UK, guaranteed not to split. So in those days, when John and Paul are first learning to play guitar and playing it together a lot, um, this is what they're looking at while they're playing, and it just, you know, they they would always remember it, much as um, Paul's guitar had a sticker on the inside of his as well. Um, they would always remember that, and it actually just seemed like a good chapter title. Many of the... It's a great... I mean, the Beatles story is just... It's a gift for any writer, because there are so many lines in it that actually sum up exactly what it is you're trying to say. Uh, and they just occur naturally, and, and that was one of them. But John writes his first song. Do you remember his first song? Well, the very first song he wrote was actually one that um, was never really mentioned in any other book. Uh, it was called Calypso Rock. Yes, Calypso. Calypso Rock, and therein lies a story. Everything has a story. Uh, very quickly, the story of that one is that... Um, Rock and roll was this incredible explosion in 1956-57, but it was it was reckoned to be by all the people who supposedly knew what they were talking about, like adults. It was reckoned to be a five-minute wonder. We've now had rock and roll for 60 years, but in those days it was thought it would finish at any moment. In fact, it was being willed to finish at any moment because it was reckoned to be something sinful and dirty and... Well, the music of delinquents, basically. So um, one of the predictions was that rock and roll would die and Calypso would be the new thing. Um, and there were all sorts of little... There was a, a little phase of, in history, like April, March, April 57, when on both sides of the Atlantic, all the record companies started making Calypso records, thinking, we'll be ready when the explosion happens. It never happened. But John Lennon, who was just writing his first song at that point, thought, well, I'll write a song that's got Calypso and rock in it at the same time, um, which was pretty clever. We know nothing of this song, however. He couldn't remember it in later years and um, barely ever mentioned it as well. But he did mention it. He went to Trinidad in 1971 um, with Yoko, looking for Kyoko, the, uh, her daughter. And wherever John Lennon went, there would always be a request for an interview. And he pretty much always said yes. And because he was in the Caribbean, or the Caribbean, as I think you would say, um, he remembered that that was actually what his first song was going to be. So when he was interviewed out there, he said, oh, by the way, my first song was called Calypso Rock. So um, I found it in this um, Jamaican newspaper from 1971 and knew that it was something important. Mm -hmm. Well, you occasionally give a whole chapter to one single day. What happened on July 6, 1957, that was so momentous? That was the date that John Lennon met Paul McCartney. Um, it was the day when it all began, really, for the two of them, um, because John Lennon is playing at a what we in England call a church fete, uh, which is just kind of a fundraising event held outdoors, typically, if the weather's fine, uh, at, at which there are kind of easy, innocent entertainments for young children. And people of all ages go and money is raised for the restoration or whatever it might be of the church. Uh, and John Lennon's skiffle group, the Quarrymen, were playing at this church fete. And one of his closest friends since infancy was a boy who went to school with Paul McCartney. His name was Ivan Vaughan. And Ivan was very careful who he introduced to his friend John Lennon because only boys truly worthy of an introduction got one because John was such, such a special young man. Uh, and he felt that his friend from school, Paul McCartney, was one such and said to him, I'm going to this church fete on Saturday. Would you like to come? I know the guy who's leading the group the skiffle group so Paul and Ivan went together Ivan introduced them 
and Paul demonstrated his talents for John uh, in a way that undoubtedly impressed him because who would not be impressed by a young Paul McCartney and uh, and that was the start of everything because very soon after that John decided to offer Paul an, an invitation to join his skiffle group and Paul joined the quarry men soon afterwards uh, and another perfect chapter title you see the song that John was singing when Paul came along that day and was watching him up on the little stage performing was Come Go With Me, which was a pretty obscure American R&B song by a group called the Del Vikings. Um, but they both knew it because they were both seriously interested in this music that was coming over from the States. And so when John Lennon is first, when Paul McCartney is first watching John Lennon sing, he's singing Come Go With Me, another perfect title. So that's why that's the title of that chapter. Well, you know, I was, you know, I've read obviously uh, about one five hundredth the number of Beatle books that you've read and material on it. But, but uh, we were always thought that that was the first time that that John uh, met Paul. And yet, down on the, let's see, what page was that? One thirty yeah, on page one thirty, uh, you have like a, an extended footnote. Could you explain? Uh, was that was that true? That was that the really first time, or was there another time? Yes, and uh, well, it's 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 always gone down as the first time they met, and it certainly is the first time they met of of real significance. Um, however, sometimes I don't know how often he does it these days, but sometimes if Paul McCartney's in Liverpool, he and he's with someone, a visitor of some kind, he will actually say to them, "Would you like me to give you a tour?" of Liverpool and he will drive them around Liverpool and point out some of the places that were important to him in his childhood and um, there was a period of time when um, uh, Paul was a, a paper boy which means he was, his job was to, to deliver the newspapers every morning before going to school he would go around the area on his bike um, and there, he says on certain occasions he will say Actually, although I did really meet John for the first time at that Walton Fate, uh, Fate in Walton, the suburb of Liverpool where John lived, uh, I had actually met him once before, not a meeting of any significance, but they had actually bumped into each other once before outside the news agency where Paul worked. Um, the John was just outside there one day and they had some kind of a, I don't know, a hello maybe or or not even that, but something that sticks in his mind. Because when Paul is taking people around Liverpool, he points it out. The ironic thing is that the name of the newsagent where Paul worked was most unusually ABBA, A-B-B-A, ABBA, which, for <laughs> considering the, um, the, the great band from Sweden of the 1970s and 80s uh, is just a bizarre, bizarre coincidence. Um, but Paul does say that that was where they met outside the news agents, but it wasn't any particular meeting. It didn't lead to anything. It was the one that they, at the church fate, that really started it. But it is a nice little footnote. Yeah, it surprised me. I was surprised mm. by a lot of things. I learned a great deal from your book. Uh, I'm sure everyone will. But why is the second half of 1957 labeled He'll Get You Into Trouble, Son? Because all of John Lennon's life from infancy onwards, he'd been the kind of boy who other parents warned their children to keep away from. Um, because he was just, he was different. He was, he had a lot more character and personality. He was more adventurous and daring. He was one of those kids who most parents would look at and go, I think I'd like my child to not be too closely associated with that boy over there. Uh, uh, but the, these boys who John Lennon did knock around with obviously thoroughly enjoyed his company and couldn't resist it. Now, Paul McCartney was one of those. As soon as he met John Lennon, he knew that he had to be uh, in this boy's life, that he was someone he wanted to hitch his wagon to, if you like, um, because John was clearly an interesting guy, a cool guy. And um, John, uh, Paul's, pe Paul's father, Paul's mother had died by this point, but Paul's father said the very words that other 
parents had no doubt said to their children, which was, he'll get you into trouble, son. Keep away from that boy. But Paul was addicted immediately. He couldn't keep away from John. Uh, and just as well for all of us that he that he didn't. Now, the interesting thing there is that um, I don't do what-ifs very well, but um, an interesting one is that Mike McCartney, that's Paul McCartney's younger brother, is absolutely certain, and has said it in a number of uh, interviews, that had their mother not died, which was about less than a year before Paul met John, the Lennon and McCartney thing would never have happened because she, as quite a strict mother, would have insisted, absolutely insisted, that Paul had nothing to do with him. As it was, although Paul's father was saying keep away from him, Paul would find a way around that, not least because... Paul's father was at work in the daytimes and provided that both Paul and John played hooky from school they could have the house to themselves and his father Jim wouldn't even know anything about it <clears throat> but had Paul's mother still been alive it would have been a lot harder for Paul to have that friendship with John so it's it's one of those tragic ironies of life that because of Paul's mother's death his friendship with John was allowed to flourish we have to take a break here, but as we do, we'll listen to one of Little Richard's songs that became a staple in the sets of the quarrymen. Listening to Paul screaming out, Long Tall Sally, kind of illustrates why Paul's dad was worried that John Lennon would get him in trouble. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Louise Harrison. I've just written a book called My Kid Brother's Band, also known as The Beatles. I hope you may enjoy it. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Cheerio. Our guest is the world's leading Beatles expert, Mark Lewison. Mark has published volume one of a trilogy of the most exhaustive and yet utterly fascinating biography of the Beatles. You have to read this, friends, if the Beatles mean anything to you at all. That song was a cover of the Crickets and Buddy Holly's song, That'll Be the Day, recorded by the Beatles in 1957 and released on the anthology. Now, This Is My Life is Chapter 9, when you cover the second half of 58. Uh, on July 15th, John Lennon's mother is killed. Uh, what are the immediate repercussions for him and the band in these next six months? Um, well, John Lennon's uh, relationship with his mother was an unusual one in that she had basically handed him over to her sister, Mary, who was known as Mimi, uh, to raise him on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and from that point onwards, which was when John was about five and a half, he didn't really see much of his mother. Um, she wasn't far away, but... She was living with another man and um, and eventually, within the two or three years, had a couple of children with him and had her hands full. And John, for various reasons, uh, didn't see a lot of her. So um, that changed when he became uh, an adolescent. Uh, and Mimi had more than her hands full with bringing him up. Uh, and he discovered that his mother was, you know, not too far away and started to hang out with her a lot more than he had done before. Um, she was a great encourager of all the kind of behaviour that most adults would have discouraged. In fact, she even encouraged him to play hooky from school in the year of his crucial exams, which is pretty unusual for a parent. Um, and very welcome for a teenager, I'm sure. And then suddenly, uh, in July 1958, she was knocked down and killed by a car. Um, and he lost her definitively at that point. And he was already, you know, a scarred child from having had a childhood in which he felt, um, though others may argue it, he felt, and that's the most important thing, that his mother, neither his mother nor his father really wanted him. So now he had, having gained her affections in the way that he really liked, she was gone, and he was devastated. Um, it didn't really have too much effect on the Quarrymen Skiffle Group, which was the band that he had, because they were already drifting apart and, and, and reducing down to essentially a, a threesome of just him and his new friend Paul McCartney and Paul McCartney's 
school friend George Harrison. They the, they were the three of them by this point. Um, but And they weren't playing very much anymore anyway, so it just kind of, it was drifting a little bit. The chapter is called This Is My Life, actually because of a, another young kid in just a couple of miles away from where they are, um, a, a young kid by the name of Richie Starkey who is not yet Ringo Starr and therefore cannot be Ringo Starr in the book until he is Ringo Starr, so he's Richie Starkey. And he is um, just coming up 18 when he um, goes... when he is in Liverpool one day and the great American singer Johnny Ray, huge star of the 1950s, very big in Britain, uh, was in the posh hotel in Liverpool, the Adelphi from an upper story window throwing down publicity photographs of himself to the crowd gathered below and Ringo who was already drumming in a a skiffle group uh, and already hoped to somehow or other make drumming his career um, looked up at Johnny Ray looked up in amazement at the way the stars lived throwing pictures of themselves from hotel windows posh hotel windows at that that he looked up there and decided that he he was 18 years old, this is my life. So, um, and the reason why he's in the story now, and not unlike most Beatles books, just coming into the book when he joins the Beatles, is because his story runs in parallel with the stories of Lennon, McCartney and Harrison, because they're in the same streets and the same buildings and the same clubs at the same time and they're listening to the same music at the same time. So I actually tell the story, I tell his story from the beginning as well as I do the other stories, because it's just as valid for me. I never understand why other books on the Beatles bring him in only when he joins the group and quickly tell his backstory, because actually the Richie Starkey story, Ringo Starr to be, is as interesting, if not more interesting, than, than even John Lennon's. I mean, it's just a great, great childhood story. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, and thanks for telling me how, how and everybody else how he got that name Ringo and and it, uh, and how those rings that he wore. I think you said that uh, he only wore four, two on each hand. Uh, yeah. But it, it kind of like it showed you a good deal more about, uh, gave you an insight into Ringo's sensitivity to those things. Um, but John, and uh, as you noted, uh, that John's actually view view of the establishment just crumbled, and then along comes around near the same time Derek Taylor. Derek Taylor. Now, why? Uh, yes, Derek Taylor. I'm trying to think why Derek's in the book at that point. Why is Derek in the book at that point? Remind me. Uh, page one eighty three. Ah, no, I think I've yes, I've got it. <laughs> the Derek Taylor who. Uh, many Beatles fans will know uh, was um, Brian Epstein's personal assistant in 1964 and became a kind of quasi-press officer for them when they were on tour in Australia and America and then became a press guy in Los Angeles having left Brian Epstein's employment and then eventually went back to work for Apple. That Derek Taylor, one of the great heroes of volumes two and three of this history, um, wrote a book called 50 Years Adrift in which he mentioned that in July 1964 when the Beatles made an incredible celebrated homecoming to Liverpool as world conquering heroes and they had a kind of motorcade drive into the city centre and a vast crowd waiting to wave at them from the balcony of the city hall uh, the town hall Um Derek wrote in this book about that day when the Beatles flew into the airport at Liverpool and John Lennon was going around telling people not to eat the sandwiches at the airport because he had once been employed there as a packer and he used to spit in them for spite. (laughs) Now, obviously, he hadn't spat in the sandwiches that day because he's talking about years earlier when he used to work there, but he had spat in them. Now, I... In my job as as the writer of this history, I have to try to apply a, a date, a precise date if possible, for every single anecdote that I find. 
Uh, and when I read that, even though it was uh, about 1964, I realised he's talking about an earlier period. So my question for myself was, well, when was John Lennon working at Liverpool Airport? And the answer that I researched and found was in the period immediately after his mother's death in 1958. School summer holidays, July to September. You know, when you're a student, especially if you're 16 or over or something, then you are eligible for work. You can actually earn some money in the summer holidays. We all do it, or have done it. And he got a job for a short period of time in the catering department at Liverpool Airport and evidently, on at least one occasion, I'm not saying he did it every day, uh, spat in the sandwiches to spite people. But here's, here's the rub. That is the airport that is now known as Liverpool International or Liverpool John Lennon Airport. It's been renamed. That very same airport has been expanded and renamed Liverpool John Lennon Airport. Um, and the very building that he used to work in is now the Crown Plaza Liverpool John Lennon Airport Hotel. And I am absolutely certain that no one at the airport or in that building had no knowledge that John Lennon actually had ever worked there. And I just love the fact that though they had named something after him, in true John Lennon style, we find out that actually he had spat in the sandwiches. So I think that is a, a, a brilliant thing to discover. Um, but and but I, I thought it would become a, a headline-making news item when this book was published, and amazingly, no one's really picked up on it. Oh, well, well most people were asleep anyway. <laughs> well, it's a book with a lot of information, so like that, oh, like that. So, you know, I, I, but I, I did expect it to become quite, an, quite a talking point, and really it hasn't been. Well, the chapter title for the second half of 1959 sounds like a Charles Boyer imitation, which is, Come uh, vis me to the Kasbah. Tell us yes. about the Kasbah, this new coffee club that introduced them to Pete Best. Yes. Pete Best, of course, being the, the, the drummer before Ringo. Um they weren't the Beatles yet. They were well. They didn't. They had a, a variety of names. They were for a while. They called themselves J Page Three and went around as a trio, John Paul and George, uh, which I knew nothing about until I started researching this book. Um, you won't read that anywhere else. And they even had a manager, uh, who I managed to find went to Paris, to France, to interview him. Um, the Casbah was. The rage in that period, in that period in the late 1950s, was a coffee bar. It was continental and exciting to have a coffee bar. And these coffee bars had coffee-making machines, espresso coffee, and it was all very glamorous in, in a non-glamorous period of, of, of this country's history. And um, one of these coffee bars was actually in the basement of a house in an area of Liverpool called West Derby. In fact, quite bizarrely, there were on this quiet residential street, there were two coffee bars and there was another one before the Casbah. In fact, the Casbah was basically an idea that was nicked from the fact that there was one already over the road. <clears throat> but the woman who opened the Casbah was in the basement of, of her house was Mona Best, who was a very energetic, quite dynamic a woman in her 30s who was the mother of two sons at that point, both of whom were teenagers, for whom she would do anything. Uh, and the eldest of her boys, whose real name was Randolph, Randolph Peter Scanlon, but he was known as Pete Best, um, was a very shy boy, very quiet, who was good at sports and, and quite popular at school in that respect, but wasn't a boy who naturally made many friends because he was so very quiet. So in an effort to kind of um, give the kids excitement and extend, broaden their friendships, she opened the coffee bar in the cellar of this big house she lived in uh, so that their kids would have a social life. And it was called the Kaz Bar. And on the opening night, the musical entertainment was, was provided by John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and another guy called Ken Brown. And they revived the name Quarrymen, 
again, even though they didn't like it because they didn't have another one. Um, and so the quarry men played the opening night and it kind of was the revival of their fortunes because they'd been drifting for a while looking for looking for a place to play and mrs best provided it and on that first day in fact in the few days before it opened when they were down there they met her son peter this very quiet young boy who didn't really say anything but they met him and within about a year he was their drummer well he uh certainly went through a number of experiences with this group especially in germany hamburg uh and uh i oh gosh i'm being told that we're almost out of time here so we're going to take our break and when we come back let's go to 1960 the swish of the curtain wherein uh in that particular chapter brian epstein george martin those stories are being told already the end of the first hour my goodness this is going fast next hour after learning a bit of the background relevance to brian epstein and george martin we'll get in the van and travel to hamburg germany the place where the beatles honed their craft and truly became the beatles we'll close this hour with one of the songs that was a staple during their time of playing the casbah coffee bar that we were just discussing it's called to know her is to love her and this was released as part of the remastered mono series don't go away that special opening music base a mucho by the beatles is from the deca audition series and was one of the songs that they played during their first meeting slash audition with george martin a surprising revelation that we'll hear more about a little later in the hour our guest for the full two hours of the show tonight is mark lewison the world's most respected historical authority of the Beatles. Mark is joining us to talk about the 900-plus page first volume of his extraordinary biography of this band that changed the world. Okay, now, let's go back to you start in 1960 with a short chapter called The Swish of the Curtain. I love some of your titles here. What curtain are you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> well, in this edition of the book, it's, uh, it, 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 it refers to the introduction into the narrative of two of the key characters uh, who need to be there from this point forward, which is Brian Epstein and George Martin. Brian Epstein, who will become their manager, the Beatles' manager, and George Martin, of course, who will become their music producer. Um, now, you might have just caught me say this edition, um, the page, the book that you've read and which you've been referring to as an 800-odd page book is actually an abridged edition of a much larger one, which can also be bought. Um, I actually, there is an edition of this volume one that runs to 1,700 pages. That's that's everything I wrote. I then abridged it for the mass market edition, which is the one that you've read and very kindly been mentioning. Oh, goodness gracious. I had no idea. Yeah. Now, in that edition of the book, George Martin and Brian Epstein are in it from much earlier. Um, the Epsteins are in it from the turn of the, turn of the 20th century. Uh, and George Martin's in it from 1945. Um, and I then tell his backstory back to through his to his uh, infancy and so on um but they come in into this for this edition in the abridged version i i stripped all that out from the earlier chapters and compiled a chapter that works actually very effectively in showing us the reader how these two men will enter the lives of john paul george and eventually ringo and how um that how, what experiences they had had that that enabled them to bring their great talents to the party now i've been saying brian epstein um because that's how he said it but his family always pronounced their surname as epstein which is why there is a constant confusion of some people calling him epstein and some epstein and they're both right um but brian himself always preferred it to be known as epstein so when i speak of brian i tend to say epstein when i speak of his family i tend to say epstein and that's a division that falls quite naturally in my head but may not be quite so uh, obvious for others the, it's called the swish of the curtain because in a sense they are both in the theatrical business in the performing arts business and here is their their bow 
if you like, in the great story, but also because it was the title of a book that Brian Epstein read as a child, which greatly encouraged and shaped his theatrical ambition. It was a, a pre-Second World War book, I think. Um, I, I do have the exact details in the book because I read it. I wanted to read the book that Brian read that had such an impact on him. Um, and it was interesting to read because amongst much else, it also is quite anti-Semitic uh, in its content um, because things were in those days, you know, one could be much more openly racist and hostile and homophobic and so on. And Brian did have to suffer not only anti-Semitism, but also once his sexuality was discerned, he had to, of course, suffer accusations of being queer as the word was in those days gay we would now say but the word gay didn't apply to homosexuality in this period so i don't use it uh, because i don't like to use vocabulary the vocabulary that isn't relevant to the period i'm writing about um but it's a tremendous story, the Brian Epstein story, um, and you, you get to, to see in this book why he was the most perfect man coming along for them at the most perfect time. Uh, and similarly, George Martin, whose career before the Beatles is a, is a truly fascinating and revealing one, and you get to understand why he was the correct producer for the Beatles. So it's important that they're introduced earlier into the Beatles history than you will typically get them in other biographies because their prior experiences are so vital. Well, this whole experience of looking at Brian really was heartbreaking for me by being just normal because as we're finding out is it's not really abnormal at all. Oh, well, I better get out of this part uh, because I'm, I'm really angry uh, about this. Yeah. The key thing was that uh, homosexuality in Great Britain was uh, illegal in the eyes of the law until 1967. Uh, and even after that, you know, just because the law changes doesn't mean that people's uh, sensibilities change. It, it takes That takes generations um, to actually change. So the life of what we would now call a gay man or a gay woman was very difficult. Uh, and in particular, since it was illegal, um, it, it led to very high incidences of blackmail because uh, people would do anything to prevent their sexuality, if it was you know homosexuality, being discovered because it would be held against them by unscrupulous people. And Brian Epstein's own partic particular sex drive um, was... Th a risk laden one he was a risk taker in life in all sorts of ways and certainly in his sex life uh, and he was laying himself open to the possibility of blackmail and was indeed blackmailed on a number of occasions certainly there's one that i write about at length in this book because there are court records and newspaper reports that one can find in the deep in the archives that will actually tell the story um and that's all very tragic stuff that you know just because of something he couldn't change, he ended up being tormented. What courage he had. Uh, excuse me, but he was. Yeah, he was he, a handsome um, man. Yes, yeah, he he, he... he... He was a risk taker. That's the point. I mean, he, he could have led his life more quietly uh, and, and kept his sexuality really quite private. Um, but he wasn't like that. He was flamboyant, and uh, he liked to um, put himself into dangerous situations. It was part of the thrill for him. Uh, and also part of uh, guilt as well. He had terrible guilt over it. Um, awful thing to suffer guilt over your, over your sex life, about which, really, you can't do anything. Um, <clears throat> so he had a, a tormented time in that period of time in fact he was tormented pretty much all of his life from the moment he was born he well certainly from his earliest ever recoll recollections of himself through to his death at the age of 32 his life was quite an unhappy one moments of great happiness but on the whole unhappiness well if he didn't have the kind of guts that he had I don't know how much longer the Beatles would have taken to be uh, recognised and 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 uh, signed up? Well, to be honest, I don't think. I mean, this is speculation because we're we're in the realms of what didn't happen here rather than what did happen. But 
I genuinely think it very likely that we would never have heard of the Beatles were it not for Brian Epstein. That doesn't mean he gave them their talent, of course not. The talent was theirs. Uh, and and um, everything about them that made them great was theirs. The charisma, the humour, the personalities, the good looks, everything, the, the musical talent. But but it, it, it probably wouldn't have got out of Liverpool um, because of the way that life was structured in those days. It needed someone like Brian. And there wasn't anyone like Brian. There just was Brian. Uh, to actually get them out of Liverpool and give bring them to present them to a wider audience. Well, no wonder the Beatles loved him so much. They did love him. Undoubtedly, they loved him. Um, John especially. The key relationship was John and Brian, because John was the leader of the Beatles, uh, and Brian Epstein knew that if ever he wanted to, or whenever he wanted to, transmit a message to the Beatles as a group, that the best thing to do was to tell it to John, and John would, you know, make sure it got heard. Uh, they had an extraordinary dynamic, the Beatles, and, and, a, and a method of communication. And John Brian knew that he had to have John's confidence in order to get anything done. Now, when I say John Lennon was the leader of the Beatles, I'm not saying I'm a bigger fan of John Lennon or John Lennon was more important than any of the others. I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about how within any group of any four people anywhere in the world, there will be a natural deference or natural sense that one of them is kind of the decision maker and the leader of that foursome. Uh, it's true of any group of people in any number. There is, it, it just occurs naturally. And John Lennon was always the leader of whoever he was with. It went back to his childhood um, because he just had that kind of a personality. And in the case of the Beatles, he had started the group and he was at least until Ringo joined the eldest, and the others looked up to him as their leader. It's as simple as that. Well, we're going to be taking a break. Um, I wanted to... Well, we have enough time for this now. Where's the bloody money? Where's the bloody money? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bloody money? Are words said by John Lennon down the telephone line from Scotland to London in May 1960, speaking to... Britain's most famous music impresario of that pre-Beatles age, a man called Larry Pons. Larry Pons was the manager of a number of uh, young boys uh, who, to whom he had each, he'd given each of them a tempestuous stage name. Tommy Steele was the first one. Then there was Marty Wilde, Vince Eager, Billy Fury, Johnny Gentle, Nelson Keane. Oh, there were loads of them. Um, no one in America really ever got to hear of any of these people. They were British talents who, whose success never really travelled. Uh, and indeed, in Britain, they never were that successful either. But somehow or other, they were packaged in such a way that that they seemed to be the epitome of British rock and roll talent in the late 1950s, beginning of 1960. And for a combination of extraordinary reasons, the Beatles ended up going on a tour, their first ever tour, uh, backing one of these singers called Johnny Gentle. And they went up to the north of Scotland and had a pretty miserable time in which they ran out of money very quickly and didn't have much to eat. And it was a grim week, really, even though it kind of seems all romantic. Um, they were, John, um, John just skipped art school to go. George threw his job in to go on this week's tour. And Paul missed a vital school exam, pretending he was ill, uh, in order to go to Scotland. But... During the course of this week, John Lennon got on the phone to Larry Pons and said, where's the bloody money? Which seems to sum up the entire week, really. Well, they were hungry and they were cold. They, they, uh, it was a miserable situation to be in. The funny thing was that they went off on this tour before they'd really played anywhere in Liverpool. Um, I mean, you would typically, you know, learn your chops first before you go out on tour. But they went out on tour as ragamuffins. Their equipment was poor and it was embarrassing. George was very embarrassed with what a shambles they were. Um, but it was an interesting week and I devote one chapter to that week. And it does have some nice heartwarming human elements to it, too, because the Beatles story in the Beatles story, they are continually attracting 
interesting people to them who give them things or invest in them in some way and that happened up there even though they were just so young and inexperienced i've read a lot about this in the past but you really brought it to life your writing encapsulates feeling in a very interesting way mark okay my producer is saying we have to take a break and we will when we return let's go to germany we haven't gone to germany yet what a place oh geez a whiz time for a break and when we get back we'll touch on the section in the book that makes the formation of the Beatles really come alive their extraordinary time of hard work and hard playing in Hamburg this song we're about to hear in fact is from a rough recording from one of those Hamburg performances we found it on a 1999 release called last night in Hamburg we'll be right back a very early recording of I Saw Her Standing There, complete with the announcer in German. Mark Lewison, the foremost authority on the Beatles, is here to describe this tour for us. The Beatles spent the next two months playing and playing and playing in Germany. Yes, I know I've repeated that three times because it, it never seemed they stop. Chapter 16 is called Mach Schu. I may have mispronounced that, meaning, of course, make show. At least that's... That's what, what I've been told over a hundred years since I've been reading this. Detailing the August the 15th to September 30th, 1960. What were some of the difficulties encountered on this trip? And what did it teach them? Huh. Well, the Hamburg, Germany, West Germany, as it was known then, because it was a, a, a country that had been split in two. Uh, post-war was um, a turning point for the Beatles. They are now the Beatles. They became the Beatles in around March, April 1960. They weren't playing very much in those days, but the, they had the name, and when they did start playing uh, in during '60, then that was the name they used. They, they get this gig to go and play in a CD bar in Germany uh, they think they're going to a place called the Kaiserkeller when they get there they find that they're playing up the street in another bar called the Indra uh, and their job is to entertain the patrons of the bar they are a bar band nothing more nothing less it's not even a club it's just a bar you can walk in off the street get a drink and over there in the, on the side of the room there's going to be a rock and roll band playing we've all been in those kind of bars um, quite unusual for them to be for there to be one in 1960 but this was not only Hamburg it was an area of Hamburg called Zank Pauli which was um, a place where the sailors went essentially Hamburg being a port city uh, a lot of ships would dock there the sailors would get off the boats with their back pockets full of pay and there were clubs and entertainments laid on for the sailors to part them from their money uh, and, and you know, red light districts and so on. And the Beatles find themselves in that kind of an area um, through an extraordinary uh, assortment of good fortune moments um, that get them there. And they're driven there by in a minibus uh, by a guy who's sort of managing them called Alan Williams, who is the real hero of 1960. Everything that happens for the Beatles in 1960 happens because of Alan Williams including that tour of Scotland that I was talking about. They go to Hamburg, and they don't really know what they're in for, but they find out because they have to sign a contract that in, it makes them play for four and a half hours uh, every single night, Tuesday to Friday, and six hours a night every Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and those are the hours of playing. They've actually got to be in the bar for longer because the, they get a pause um, in every hour, but they still got to hang around. So they're basically six nights a week spending between four and a half and six hours a night playing. Well, they've never played anything like this amount of time in their life before. They don't even have this many songs in their repertoire. So they learn, and they learn fast, and they learn the hard way by making lots of mistakes, but by getting it together. They find out who they are in Hamburg, and immediately, being these kind of a guys, they set themselves a challenge of not repeating themselves so they decide that even if they're playing for six hours a night they're not going to play the same song twice which really does broaden and deepen their repertoire 
uh, and it, it turns them from shambling amateurs, which is pretty much what they are when they arrive, to well, they're not shambling anymore, and they're pro- and they're pretty much professional. They are they're a, they're a group who've got it together. There are five of them at this point. There's John, Paul, George, Stuart, the bass player, and Pete, the drummer, who they've grabbed just before they go to Hamburg. And he's pretty much a beginner, and so is Stuart. And they're not much more than beginners themselves, certainly in terms of stage experience. So they learn. Uh, And when they return from Hamburg, they play six weeks at the Indra and then they play in the Kaiser Keller uh, for the next what from the beginning of October till most of November so they're out there for about three and a half months and um, in the Kaiser Keller they're playing 12 hour shifts with another group from Liverpool called Rory Storm and the Hurricanes whose drummer is Ringo Starr and that's how they get to know Ringo um when they return to Liverpool at the end of three and a half months of six nights a week playing for at least six, well, up to six hours a night, they are dynamic. They're completely dynamic. And, uh, and from that point on, the rest is fast forward. Yeah. Pedals and prellies. What are we talking about here? Beatles? Well, um, the word Beatles we've now had 50 in America you've had 52 years of knowing who the Beatles are and in Britain we've had 53 but there was a time when that name seemed repulsive they were always being told before they were famous change your name because it's a useless name it's a stupid name it's a horrible name ugh name Beatles yuck change it you'll never make it with a name like that which just goes to show you what people what the people who think they know what they're talking about generally don't um but in germany it it it, it was confused happily for by a few people with another name pedals which actually is kind of a german slang name for for willy it's a it's a silly it's a silly willy name it's it's a name for what what young men have between their legs or any men of any age have between their legs pedals oh, i didn't want to say penis so oh that's okay uh, um so a few people call them pedals and in in the area in the clubs that they're playing in some people enjoy calling them that so they certainly knew that name pedals and prellies prellies is a slang name that they and probably a few others around them came up with to describe or to uh, for a pill that they were beginning to take called preliodin. Preliodin is a was a German women's slimming pill. The idea being that it would speed up your metabolism and you wouldn't be quite so hungry and you'd eat less food and so lose weight. Um, but it was realised that since they were playing in the clubs for such long hours which was really exhausting to do because they were also trying to live, you know, a life while they were out there of hell raising, if they could get away with it. Uh, So they weren't sleeping a lot. And when you're playing six hours on a Monday night and then six hours on a Tuesday night and then six hours on a Wednesday night, by Thursday you're wrecked. So they discovered that these pills would keep them, keep them awake because it would speed up their metabolism. So they began to take pills. Not all of them. Pete never took the pills. Uh, Stuart did. Paul d- took some, but it wasn't that keen. George took quite a lot, and John took loads, which was pretty much the way that the Beatles' drug taking would always be defined. Um, and um, so that's the, hence the subject, the title of that chapter is Pedals on Prellies. Uh, this was the second time they went to Germany. They went there five times in all in this in this early period. Uh, and the, it, they didn't really know these pills the first time they went. They were just drinking beer. The second time they went there, they were drinking beer and taking pills. And that's why it's called Pedals on Prellies. We're running out of time, so I'm going to skip ahead here to 1962 when they first met George Martin. One of the things that I've been wanting to get to, but I'm hesitating to get to it, Mark, has to do with uh, Sir George Martin and and the truth of just how the Beatles got their contract. Yes. And now this is, uh, to me, it was uh, just, I was shocked. 
I was a little bit shocked. Yeah, I think most people have been, yeah. Could you could you explain to us how they really got this contract? Because this is one of the great things about your work. There are so many people that write books on the Beatles and my gosh, they spend a half an hour with them or something like that and that and that gives them the right to do what they want to write. But this situation as to how they got the contract, it's a it's a good it's a, to me a good idea to really give credit to where it should have gone. But it hasn't. It all comes down to research. Um, I am a, a natural-born researcher. It's it's um, it's it's it's. I love researching. I I never stop researching. It, it you can't stop because it it, it carries on. Um, but I welcome it. I totally welcome all information, and I actively, on a daily basis, go looking for it. It's my job. Um, and research is the basis for these books documentation in particular is, is is underpinning everything that i write i wasn't present at any of these events i wasn't there i can't say what happened um but i can speak to people who were and in particular i can find pieces of paper that explain what happened letters contracts and so on uh, i have no axe to grind i'm writing this book even-handedly uh, i have no agenda of any kind i'm not pushing anybody's story or putting anybody down i'm just looking for everything i can find and reporting what i find and in the case that you're referring to um it, this all goes back to 1991 now in 1987 88 i was the author of a book called the, the beatles recording sessions uh which detailed all of the Beatles recording sessions from at, at EMI at Abbey Road from the first visit in June 1962 till the end of the project that became Let It Be. Um, at that time, everybody I spoke to said that the Beatles' very first visit to Abbey Road in June 1962 was an audition, a test of some kind. And of course, it made perfect sense that it should be so because that's what you do you get auditioned and then someone says we'll sign you and you get signed and then you start your recording career so that's what i wrote and then in 1991 three years after that book came out i discovered a file of papers at emi that reveal without beyond any shadow of a doubt that actually that first set visit to abbey road was not an audition at all that they were already signed they were signed before they ever went to the studio. Why? That's the question that I then had to find the answer to. Why? Why were they signed? What was the story here? Um, and at that time, I was working a lot with George Martin. We were working together um, quite closely on a, a TV special that was seen in 1992 called The Making of Sergeant Pepper. Uh, I was I was the researcher on that, and I was in on it from the pre all the preliminary meetings at all the film shoots uh, at George's house and in the Abbey Road and so on, all the way through to the edit suite. And that's where we were in the edit suite one day, and I said to George, look, I've got all these papers from the e EMI archive. They've got your signature on them, but they clearly indicate that you signed them before you saw them. Why did you do that? And I spread the papers out for george to look at and he he, he genuinely he, i was impressed by the fact that he genuinely seemed not to understand what it was these pieces of paper were telling him he could see what they were telling him but it made no sense to him he appeared to have genuinely not remembered it this way anymore and the reason for that as i later discovered and there's nothing sinful about this whatsoever it's just life is that having told a different story for so long he remembered it only the way he was telling it but the story of how the Beatles came to be signed to EMI was never actually told by anybody publicly and it was pretty soon swept under the carpet um, not that there was anything embarrassing about it but it was just swept under the carpet and a news story was told that everyone then subscribed to and no one ever challenged because why would you and I was only challenging because I'd seen these pieces of paper well, with George being unable to tell me what the story was, I still didn't know. Um, but I knew that there was a man I needed to find who called himself Kim Bennett. 
um, a man who worked in music publishing in London for a, an EMI publishing company called Ardmore and Beechwood. Uh, and eventually, in 2003, I found him, and I'm glad I did because he was dead within a couple of years, and then we would never have known this. But Kim Bennett was the missing link in this story, whose name had never been written really by anybody, uh, certainly not with the full realisation of what he was responsible for. And the truth is that were it not for Kim Bennett, we wouldn't be talking about the Beatles now. He really is an unsung hero of this story, and sadly never lived to see me tell it because he died, as I said, a couple of years after I met him. But he was the one who had the idea that um, that EMI should... One of the EMI record labels should record this group, The Beatles, because they wanted to publish one of the songs, in particular a song called Like Dreamers Do, which he had heard on the tape of The Beatles' failed test at Decca. And Kim Bennett's energy and his ridiculous, uh, really quite ridiculous um, uh, determination never to let anything drop, because I saw many other examples of this in Kim Bennett's life and career when I researched it. He was a tenacious man who never let anything go. Because of that, the Beatles were... It, there was, it was understood that the Beatles would be signed by one of the EMI labels. Now, which one was it going to be? And the man who was running the label at that time, called L.G. Wood, Len Wood, who is another unsung hero of this story, there'll be a lot about Len Wood in volumes two and three. He was the Beatles' key man at EMI. He was the one with whom they had the, the best relationship in terms of business. Um, Len Wood made George Martin sign the Beatles. It was an assignment you will sign these people and you will record them. There was very little to lose and it wasn't George Martin's own money so he did as he was bid and signed them and then he met them and when he met them he realised that they were people he could work with. He realised immediately, he recognised that they were original, they were different, they were challenging, that they were rule breakers as he was and a beautiful relationship began. Well, we need to take our final break. We're going into the commercials listening to Like Dreamers Do, the original Beatles song from the DECA audition session that, as we just found out, was the real reason EMI had already signed the Beatles before George Martin even met them. We have a few more stunners in store when we come back with our guest, Mark Lewison, and tune in The Beatles All These Years, Volume 1, published by Crown Archetype. So don't go away. Hello, this is Alistair Taylor. I was general manager of The Beatles, and I love 21st century radio, especially Dr. Bob Hieronymus. I met him, and it was a joy. Author of Tune In, The Beatles All These Years, Volume 1, from Crown Archetype Publishers, www.tuneinbook.com. This interview will be archived for free at our website, www.21stCenturyRadio.com, so check it out and tell your friends. In this final segment, we'll talk about the death of Stuart Sutcliffe and then the day in 1962 that the 60s began for real. Now, we have a momentous three days in April from April 10th to the 13th of 1962 that uh, got its own chapter. You called it, quote, he could easily have been the Beatle. This is a chapter relating their reactions to the tragic death of Stuart Sutcliffe at the age of 21. Could you tell us about Stuart Sutcliffe and how he met his end? Yeah, actually the the pronunciation, there is an italicized word in that title. It's, it's he could easily have been the Beatle. Um, and, and that was said by um, a, a, an internationally famous artist sculptor called Eduardo Paolozzi, who was a teacher of Stuart Sutcliffe at Hamburg Art School in 1961-62 and a man who knew what he was talking about Stuart Sutcliffe had been known to John Lennon since John joined the art school in Liverpool in 1957 Stuart was in the uh, academic year above John um, so he had started the year earlier a prodigiously gifted artist in all forms uh, um, and also highly productive um, 
died at the age of 21, but left a huge amount of work behind, um, quite disproportionate to his years. Stuart became more and more important in John's life um, at the end of the 1950s, in that period after his mother was killed. They were they became very good friends. Um, and when Stuart came into some money for winning an art prize at the beginning of 1960, uh, he was persuaded to buy a bass guitar and join well, what became the Beatles, but they weren't yet the Beatles. The name Beatles really came up between John and Stuart, um, but the spelling with the A was, was John's. Um, and he was a beginner on bass. Uh, he was a, a great rival for Paul. Um, Paul was very jealous of Stuart's friendship with John uh, and behaved that way pretty much consistently. So there was a tension in the Beatles when Stuart was there because Paul was not happy about him being there and behaving in, in ways that would undermine him. Um, but he was a Beatle, Stuart, um, for uh, 18 months or so until the end of the Beatles' second visit to Hamburg in July 1961 when he stayed in Hamburg and went back, went to art school, resumed his studies. Had a girlfriend called Astrid Kircher who had taken some great pictures of the Beatles um, the year before. Um, so the Beatles carried on. They returned to Liverpool and became a foursome for the first time. They had, they had been five until this point. And around that time that Stuart was there, he began to suffer um, debilitating headaches, really quite terrible headaches, like severe migraines, only, if that's possible, even worse, really quite shockingly bad headaches. Uh, and there were some investigations into what was causing these headaches, but... Um, Nothing was ever really found. Uh, he came back to Liverpool. Um, they all saw him again in the beginning of 62. He didn't look very well. He looked, as Alan Williams said, like a man who was about to die. But he was only 21, so it didn't seem very likely. Um, but in April 1962, with the Beatles three days away from uh, another long season in Hamburg, this time at a place called the Star Club, it was their third visit, um, Stuart died of a brain hemorrhage, um, which is evidently the cause or the result of the headaches, um, at the age of 21 in the arms of his fiancée Astrid. And when the Beatles arrived in Hamburg to, for a seven-week season, they discovered that Stuart was dead, and it was obviously a, a, a deeply traumatic thing for all of them. Um, and 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 in, for John, having lost his father uh, to absence and his mother to to death, and now his great friend Stuart dead at the age of twenty one, John was John fell apart basically. But he was in the right place to fall apart because in Hamburg you could misbehave as much as you like, and it was kind of tolerated. And he rampaged for a few weeks and returned to Liverpool somewhat saner for the experience but um, it was deeply traumatic and Stuart never lived to see the Beatles conquer the world which was um, you know an, a remarkable thing that you know to be dead at 21 yeah very 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 sad geez mm. was, uh, the where was he beat up was it in Liverpool when he came back home well, he had been Stuart. I mean, the Beatles played in Liverpool solidly in nineteen sixty one, sixty two, and not much before it, and not much after. But that was the Liverpool period. That's the Cavern period, and then lots of other venues as well. And though the Cavern was um, pretty much a safe place, most of the other places the Beatles played were you took your life in your hands playing in those places because there was quite a lot of violence, quite a lot of gangs, quite a lot of beatings. Um Liverpool was a violent place. Um there are lots of places were violent places and it tended to go with rock and roll music as well. So um one of the nights they were playing at a place in the north end of Liverpool called the Latham Hall in Seaforth. Um there was a fight afterwards. There was always a fight somewhere and their job was to avoid it. Um, but sometimes they couldn't avoid it, and Stuart got uh, kicked quite badly that night by some teddy boy thugs, uh, some gangs, basically, um, because he was 
different, you know, because he was small, because he wore glasses, because he read books, because he was different. That was enough to get a, a kicking. So Stuart got kicked in the head. Now, in 1981, the author Philip Norman, writing a biography of the Beatles called Shout, made a direct correlation between the kick in the head uh, and his death, which was uh, more than a year later. Um, Medically, I think that has been disproven, as much as anything can be disproven, since it was all so long ago. Um, but it, he he kind of cemented that theory into reality, which I'm not sure anyone could be that certain about, to be honest. Uh, and then, to cap it all, Stuart's sister, one of his two sisters, he had two sisters, one of whom we hear a lot from, or have heard a lot from, and one of whom we never really have heard anything. Uh, one of the sisters, um, Pauline, um, in her third book on Stuart, not the first book and not the second, suddenly comes up with the claim that actually John Lennon kicked Stuart in the head and hastened his death, um, which I have very eloquently disproved by uh, someone who really would know the difference, uh, and that is... Pauline herself <laughs> because before she wrote that in a book that Stuart had done this she had actually said to me on tape that there's absolutely no way that this this outrageous accusation which was first made by Albert Goldman could possibly be true so um, th there is no correlation really um, certainly nothing that one can prove um, the reality is that um, for whatever reason he he'd always been an unwell and somewhat um, thin and and anemic looking young man and um, he died at the age of 21 now here's a date of momentous concern Friday October the 5th 1962 you give a whole chapter to this one day what yeah. happened on this date uh, for you to name it the 60s start here well, it's the date that the Beatles' first record is released, Love Me Do, a momentous day in their lives because they did... The, the epitome, the absolute extent of their ambition at this point was to make a record, um, and this was their debut, Love Me Do, out that Friday. But it was also the date when so much else happened. Um, just by coincidence, un unrelated to the Beatles... Um, there's uh, Rolling Stones are playing one of their first dates and Bob Dylan is playing one of his first dates all on the 5th of October um, it's the first James Bond film is is unveiled that day and the Bond films epitomise the 60s as much as the Beatles do well almost as much, not quite um, but there's also lots else going on drugs are beginning to happen and, and kids are beginning to really use their spending money and uh, all sorts of events that occurred that presage what would happen in the rest of the 60s all seem to happen on the 5th of October. So really it's a case of the 60s start here. Um, because the, the decades don't always begin on the 1st of January in that given year. They tend to begin two or three years in. And um, this was when the 60s began. You know, uh, one of the quotes on the back of your book uh, is really moves me. It It was... It all boils down to this. They were four war babies from Liverpool who really did change the world and whose music and impact still live on in so many ways. After all these years, let's scrub what we know or think we know and start over. Who really were these people and how did it all happen? You really did a masterful job here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. The reason that I wrote that on the back cover is, is in essence, the reason why I'm doing these books, because I'm, you know, I'm still working on volume two now, and then I've got volume three to write. And that is that I felt that the the Beatles were too important to our culture um, and too important to history to um, for the existing biographies to serve as the best books there, there were. I knew that the the Beatles were worthy of deeper research, that the story hadn't really ever been told in the way that I felt would be considered properly. And that's the challenge I set myself, is to who were these people and how did all this happen? Um, and through research you begin to realise that actually it's, it's an unknown story. So um, I'm delighted to be telling it. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you. Oh, dear. We really are out of time. This has been delightful. Thank you for joining us for two hours. Mark Lewison, an author of Tune In, The Beatles All These Years, Volume 1, available from Crown Archetype Publishing and from all booksellers. Check him out on the web at marklewison.net. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Kortner. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and remember to get a hair.